Good evening, brothers. I said I'm really proud to be presenting here and very honored to be presenting because as I was preparing, I was looking at several statistics about the churches and men's participation in the churches. And it said that only 10% of the American churches have men's clubs. So you are in the top 10 of the American Christian churches. When I was getting a job, one of my friends was helping me to get it. I was really nervous to leave my other job to go to a new one. And he said, why are you worried about? This company is Fortune 500 company. Come on over. There's nothing to be afraid of. So you are more than Fortune 500. You're up to 10% of the churches. And that deeply and clearly speaks about your care, first of all, about your families, about your nation, about your religion, and everything in the society in general. Just the fact that you deeply care for our youth in the church already speaks about the importance of the men's presence in the church. I want to tell you just a little bit about myself and then I'm going to present the spiritual life's importance in, in a person's life and how we grow as spiritual human beings. I was born in Armenia, as you, all you probably know, and I, until 12, 15 years old, I had a pretty calm life. The Soviets were providing basics that you could live without cares. And then after that, we were independent. And independence brings a lot of burden and a lot of care. You need to stand up for yourself. Nobody's going to protect you anymore. So we had to go through about five years of war with the Turks. And that was kind of a shaping time for me. And then after that, I went to college three years to become a teacher. Then I discovered the church. But it's very interesting that it was my father who, in a passing, mentioned there is, he said, also a chance of going and studying at the seminary, which was going to open in the village that I was living. Partially because he wanted his son next to him to support him and help him in the uh, economy in a village. And secondly, maybe it was a revelation from God, I don't know. But this is directly connected what I will be saying soon. Then I went to the seminary about seven years and I was assigned to come to Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology another three years here at uh, Holy Cross in Brookline. After that, I was very blessed to be accepted to the Greek Church by Metropolitan Methodius and more blessed to be part of this beautiful community here. We just received today by the Mayor uh, Edward Benincourt the Declaration of the Independence and Acceptance of the Greek Independence uh, in America and, and in Peabody, recognizing the fact that the Greeks are an independent nation. I was just reflecting on it, and I think we share a lot as Armenians and Greeks that history because we have intensively been persecuted throughout 600 years uh, of Turkokratia and intensively slaughtered and executed throughout this 600 years. But, at the result, we have come out and we have declared independent country. And, on top of that, as they say, wherever they plant us, that's where we bloom. And today, Peabody is the speaking example of the fact that these poor immigrants came to this country with nothing, almost nothing, and they started a church in their neighborhood and have heard many stories that they have put their homes under mortgage and paid for the church. That brings the church equal to our homes, meaning that for me, my family and the church are equal. There is no difference between church and family. And that's what I want to talk about because also, I found some other statistics that show that in American culture most Christian churches are female dominated. Not in a bad way, it's not like the women are trying to take over the churches. 
it's that the men are usually invisible in the church. When I was in the seminary, of course this was after the Soviet Union, every morning and every evening we had a service. And then plus we had the Sunday liturgy. 99% of the people who were praying in the church were female. They were all ladies that we have today in Peabody, whose prayers I am sure are most valuable and the most important. But as we are advancing in technologies and in culture and everything, we are reflecting upon our future closer. And the statistics show that in America, out of six men, five men declare, claim that they believe in God. But only one of six people, six men, go to church. Also, it shows that if males don't go to church, their sons don't go to church. Only 3.5% of male children will continue to go to church if their fathers don't go to church. So in Christianity it seems like male presence is very important. Recently in a presentation I said that Christianity is one of the largest religions in the world but it's shrinking every year. And somebody from the audience said, well Islam is growing. I said, that's right. And she said, you know what the reason is? I said, what? It is that Islam is male dominated religion. When you look at the mosques where people are praying, you see 99.9% .9 male presence. The females are either not present or they're somewhere else. The same thing is true for Judaism, same thing is true for Buddhism and other religions. There are two reasons for those. One is that we have been constantly massacred as Christians. And when you have always an enemy at the border, where you think man will be? They'll be in arms and they will be defending their country. And who will be praying back in the church? their wives and their daughters. Sometimes, unfortunately, our wives and daughters had to also go to the battlefield and defend ourselves and themselves. But that's one of the reasons that our men have developed that other presence in the church. They are the protective guardians of the church, but they are not necessarily present in the prayer life. Where in America, we don't really necessarily need to continue that same way. The other reason is that Christianity came and elevated women from almost being equal to nothing. In the ancient world, females were considered to be tools. Best case scenario, they were tools for bringing children to this world. Otherwise, they were just workers. They would go gathering fruits and vegetables and working in the fields. God has multiple ways of presenting himself. He could have just descended from the heaven. But when Christ came, well, he was born from a virgin to say that my mother will be almost equal to myself. That's why in the churches we have Christ on one side of the royal gates and Theotokos on the other side, because Christ has elevated the female figure in the whole human history, equalizing to the men. Many of his disciples were female. When Jesus was crucified, all of his male disciples ran away, and only female were standing at his cross, and one of his male disciples, John. I mean, there are different reasons for that. One of it is that females were not threatened to be killed. They didn't care about them. But males would be killed if they were present. But another one is that throughout the centuries, females have proven to be closer to Christ throughout all the Christian history. One day when I was at Holy Cross, there was a Ukrainian bishop present. And 
somebody asked him, they said, Your Eminence, when will women have important role in the church, perhaps into ordination? And he said, our women have always served in the churches. He said, when in Soviet Union, our priests were afraid to go outside of the church, they remained in the church and did their services, and people were afraid to come to church, there were only few female ladies, old women, that would come because they were the bravest. And on top of that, when the liturgy was over, the priest took the andidro, put the communion inside of the andidro, and covered it up, and handed it to these old ladies, and they delivered it to all the members of their community, so that they also have communion, despite the fact that they couldn't come to church. When God in the beginning created man, that's what we translate into English, but in Hebrew, the word man means human being. It's the anthropos, the Greek translation is more accurate, which included in itself both male and female beginnings. Then God separated them from one another. So as far as our service goes in the church, men and women are supposed to be together working hand to hand, shoulder to shoulder. And the dance here that was presented is the perfect example of showing what Christianity is about. The kids were dancing, they were in a circle. Circle is the strongest geometrical shape. But they were not in a closed circle. So Christianity is that strong circle, but because when you make a circle, it's closed shape, there is no more entering, the dance has two open ends. So that anybody who wants to join is free to catch on and start dancing with them. So that's very beautiful. I mean, I don't know if that's the reason that that's how the dance is danced, but that's what I was looking at and I was thinking about it, that you can go away from it and anytime you want to join, you can come back. And that's how Christianity is. Our doors are always open. That anybody who wants to join is freely invited and welcome to join, regardless of their ethnicity, language, nationality, doesn't matter. Christianity is welcoming all and all, male and female. And they are equal in the church. So this is what Christianity is about. And we have proven to be a very strong nation as Christians. I'm not talking about Armenians, I'm not talking about the Greeks. Christianity is one nation. And as that, we have proven to shape entire European cultures. We have proven to create medicine. We have proven to create sciences. All the hospitals in Massachusetts are named after saints. That's not accidental. It's because they were opened by churches. So we have the strongest, best hospitals in Boston. That's thanks to Christianity. Christianity has also created a capitalism the most successful form of society in the world. So these are the benefits from Christianity and we are proud to be part of that and be part of that great legacy. But I want to share one story with you that proves how strong Christianity is. You all probably have heard about Cyril and Methodius, those were the evangelists of Russians but they were Greek from the Byzantium. Before Cyril was ordained into priesthood, his name was Constantine, and he was known to be a philosopher, unbeatable philosopher, a Christian philosopher. So at one point, the Muslims make fun of Christianity, and they send a letter to the Patriarch of Constantinople and ask him to send someone who can compete in rhetorics or in religion specifically. So the Patriarch calls, there is no one better than Constantine, calls him and says, do you need to go? So the first thing that they bring up, the Muslims, is that what is this saying that you guys have and you do not keep? They say that your prophet, Christ, they call Christ the prophet, says that when somebody hits you on one of your cheeks, you turn the other also. 
But you guys don't keep that. And he says, what do you mean we don't keep that? Yeah, he says, when we attack you, you take your rifles, your weapons, and come right out and start fighting against us, and we cannot take over, over Constantinople. Constantine says, you have read only one part of the New Testament. You have to understand this in its entirety. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our God, has also said that no one has greater love than the one who puts down his life for his brother. So when you rebels, he says, come and try to kill our brothers, we don't have other choice but to stand up and die for them. And that's why you cannot conquer Constantinople. So this shows the strength of Christianity in centuries. And from the very beginning, we have had martyrs. The Roman emperors have tried to wipe out Christians many, many times, and they have failed. Eventually, Constantine says, we are going to accept Christianity. But that was not the end of the persecutions, because when we live in comfort, we forget about God. And that's human. When we are self-sufficient, we become our own God. We don't need anybody else to protect or be with us. Where the martyrs were always under the threat of the emperor's executions and persecutions, so they were constantly relying on God. Now when the Constantine embraces Christianity, Christians get relaxed. Nobody is persecuting them anymore, so Christianity starts getting weaker. Plus, there are all kinds of heresies coming out and saying all kinds of things. And so Christianity had been suppressed by this gesture. But Christianity comes out triumphantly in Byzantium, where it creates that awesome uh, empire that lasts thousand years. We need to look at the history and we will see that when Constantine became an emperor, the Roman Empire was in its decline. It was falling apart because it was so big and there were so many nations included into it and all these nations had their own principalities and their armies, they didn't care about Constantine or the any emperor. But Count Constantine embracing Christianity made his empire last another thousand years. So this shows the importance of Christianity, the greatness of Christianity as a gift, not only for our own salvation, but also for the society. But today we are facing another enemy. We're facing individualism. And that's probably why 10% of the churches only have men's clubs because we all are immersed into our daily lives, in our businesses, in our careers, and we are the master of our own boat. We don't need anybody else there. We don't want to share power with anybody. We don't want to communicate with anybody else. We have become individuals. The word individual means that you divide something as far that you cannot divide it anymore. So that's what the society has become, divided. It's the exact opposite of what our children were dancing. And it's not accidental that Greeks or Armenians or other cultures have created dances like that. They could have created dances that you go and dance in the corner of the room and somebody else on the other corner and you don't communicate with each other as long as you hear the same music. But they have created this bonding kind of dance that we are together and we cannot be broken. And if we go separate from each other, we will be in trouble. So in that sense, the spirituality of Christian life is very, very, very important to nourish our society, our churches, and especially our young people who are divided in many, many ways, very easily, very easily. If you look at the human being in ancient times, sometimes humans were considered just another animal or a tool that was working in your garden or the best would be a human being that can philosophize. But Christianity looks at human beings as a whole being. There is an expression, it says, 
a human being without a soul is a corpse, dead body. And a soul without a body is a ghost. So Christianity looks at a human being as a whole, full entity. As male and female are the human fullness, also the spirit, the soul, and the body are the full human being. If you stop thinking that there is soul, you automatically declare yourself to be a corpse. In the history, they have compared the human being to the cosmos. And you have probably heard microcosm. Humans are microcosm. Gregory the a theologian says, when you call a human being a microcosm, you're comparing them to the mosquitoes. Because mosquitoes are a microcosm too. But humans are created in the image and the likeness of God. And that's what our value is. We are in the image of God. And when we look at us our, as a corpse, as a dead body, we're ultimately offending God, throwing His image into the garbage and saying, we don't need this. So as far as the religious education goes, it is part of human development. Humans develop in multiple ways. First of all, the most visible thing is we develop physically. We also develop mentally. You can think, you can write, we develop socially. We can communicate, we can be socializing with each other, we can create a club. Where in modern society, that's one of the failing parts where we socially don't develop so that we cannot communicate with other people and we cannot create bonds. But we create bonds with our electronics. We also develop emotionally. We also develop spiritually. So all these categories are creating the wholeness of the human being. Some of them can be measured, some of them cannot be measured. For example, if I was foot and a half standing from the floor and I was only 10 pounds here talking, you would tell that I physically didn't develop. I could be intellectually developed and I could deliver a beautiful message even though I was so small, but physically I wouldn't be developed. Or it doesn't matter how big I was, if I stand here and I cannot talk, you can say this guy hasn't developed intellectually, doesn't have a way of putting two words together. If I was here and somebody made a joke over there and I got offended and I left, you could say, well, he's a grown-up man, but it seems like he emotionally he hasn't developed. He couldn't understand a simple joke. So also is our spiritual development. It's so important. Because I was here to develop, deliver something and if I left, was this 25, 30 men would be standing there like, what the heck did he do? So it is important to be developed. If I stood here and I couldn't speak, it was like, well, we invited him, he didn't deliver anything. So it's important to be developed intellectually. And if you couldn't see me, you'll say, well, his parents didn't feed him enough. But we take care of all these things, but we take care of them less and less and less. We mostly today pay attention to our physical, that our kids grow, they go to sports and everything, they have developed all these muscles and everything. And also we make sure they get to the best colleges so that they can make a lot of money when they grow up. Those are the two things, the two main things that are always in our heads. I make sure that my kid is healthy and I make sure that he goes to a good college and gets a good job. What about the rest? What about the rest that somebody can be present among the youth group and you try to start a conversation and they cannot talk. They're constantly with something, playing with something, and they cannot concentrate. What about the fact that you try to talk to them and after three minutes you lose them because they can't listen. They are not able to concentrate. What about if you make a joke with them and all of a sudden they don't show up the next time because they're offended. They cannot stand up for themselves and make the same kind of emotional gesture towards you. But these things, the psychologists and physicians can measure all these things. The most endangered, endangered development of the human being is the spiritual development. And that's the most important. When I said in the beginning that Christ came through a Virgin Mary 
to elevate the female end of humanity, he also was incarnate as a man to elevate the male. And our fathers say that Christ is the perfect man. We all are caricatures of Christ. We are all the simple models of Christ. But all of us have a goal to become like Him. Male and female, we need to become like Christ. A mature, developed, grown-up human being. Because, as I said, we can grow physically, but the other parts will lock. And we will not be what we are meant to be, what we are supposed to do. Today, there is statistics that the millennials are not trustworthy. You cannot trust them even with a simple job, because they will quit the next day. Many of you probably have stuck with your jobs, even if you hated it, because it mattered to be a manly man and say, I can do this, and I'm going to do it to the end. But what does it say to us today that our millennials are not trustworthy? It means that we are not helping our young generation to grow up. And spiritual growth is the most important growth. And that depends on you today. Our children that were present here will drop off from their churches if you do not continue to support by ultimate presence in the church. I enjoy so much when I come out of the gate and I see families, all of them, I don't mean their wives with their kids, all of them sitting in the pews in the front and praying with the congregation. That's the most beautiful image I, I experience every time. And that shows that the church today is as important to them as the church was important to your fathers who built the church. They mortgaged their homes to build the church. These families who are present in the church, they are keeping it to run and stay, remain, so that it does not fall apart. When I went back to Armenia 10 years ago, I went to my old house where I grew up. Nobody lives there. What do you think was the condition? Never the same. All the walls were crumbling, the roof had started caving in, the floors, everything, the ceilings. Not because nobody was renovating it. The old houses in the old country, you don't need to renovate because there are stone buildings, you don't need to do much. All you have to do is live in them. If you stop living in them, that's when they start crumbling down. So, I want to thank you for being this great group of men who are very unique in the United States. 10% of the United States churches have men's clubs. I can't mention that enough. And you are one of those 10% population. That you support your church, that you make them to stay alive and go on and support the whole entire society. The church is not for Peabody. The church is for the whole entire universe, for the whole entire world. Our monasteries in Mount Athos are known to hold the weight of the world on their shoulders. Many people have said, Christian and non-Christian, that if the monks in Mount Athos stop praying, the world will fall apart, especially with the leaders that we have started raising. So if there is no prayer, if there is no Christian courage and love and care, the world will fall apart. And we are thankful to you for doing that. Thank you.